Hi, and welcome to The Christian Contrast, where we talk about how walking with Jesus leads us to live differently than those in the world around us. And I'm Dan here with a, a solo episode this time, and we're gonna be talking about baptism, which I'm excited about because I love baptisms. I love when we do baptisms. I love it when I have the privilege of being involved in baptizing people. Um, but baptism, for, for those of us that, who are involved in the church, um, there are always questions surrounding this. Uh, because it's something that has symbolism involved, it there can just be the question of what, what exactly is going on here? Like, what, why do we do this thing? What, what's the significance of baptism? Um, and beyond that, there's controversies between churches about who should we baptize, when should we baptize, and even how we should baptize. Um, I, I'm excited to talk about this topic for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, because if, if you're a part of LBF Church, we have a baptism coming up on April 14th. We're getting ready for that. It's always a rich time where we get to do a baptism um, for our church family. Uh, and also just because that there's different ones of you who are listening who may just be kind of mystified, like, what is this thing? I see people doing it and I'm still unclear with it. Um, or you might even have questions about yourself in terms of this. Maybe some of you are saying, I, I was baptized as an infant and now I don't know, should I be baptized again? Some of you are like, I've been a Christian for 30 years and I never got baptized. Is it important for me to do it now? And, and so just, I wanted to take on those different questions. So I, we'll, we'll walk through this, um, hitting four questions. We'll hit a lot of scripture and just helping us understand this. We'll talk about what baptism is. Um, we'll talk about how we should baptize. We'll talk about who we should baptize. And we'll talk about when we should baptize. And that'll just be the, the framework for going through this. Um, so we'll just start with the big question, what is baptism? What is this thing that we do as Christians that involves water and dipping people and public confession of faith and all that sort of thing? So if we're going to the Bible, the first time we, we really see baptism come up, come up surrounds John the Baptist. Um, so John the Baptist shows up as a forerunner to Jesus. And one of the things that we have him saying as he is going around and baptizing people is in Matthew 3.11, he says to them, I baptize you with water for repentance. Um, and there's statements made later on in the Gospels and even in the book of Acts about how John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Um, now, here's what seems to be going on during that time. What seems to be going on is that there was a custom among the Jews that when there was a Gentile, a non-Jewish person who wanted to convert to Judaism, who wanted to become a part of the people of Israel and identify with them, that that person would go through a baptism, sort of a ritual washing. Um, and it did sort of have the idea of washing away the old life and having now a new life. And so it seems like by the time John the Baptist was around, that the Jews had some level of familiarity with the concept of baptism, but it was the idea of you're an outsider, you're not a Jew, you're converting, and you're entering into the Jewish community. You, you've adopted and you believe in the Jewish God, who we believe is the one true God. Um, all of that has happened. And so John is changing the game, and he's calling Jews to repentance and baptism. Most as if saying to them, all right, that there's something going on. Just because you were born Jewish doesn't mean that you don't still need to repent and go through this conversion experience. And so that leads up to the time of Jesus. And people are coming to Jesus, and while we don't have any evidence that Jesus himself is baptizing anyone, um, what we have maybe a little bit during Jesus' life, and then especially after Jesus' death and resurrection, we have baptism into the name of Jesus. And so a couple things seem to be at the center of Christian baptism as it transferred from John to Jesus being kind of the, the centerpiece of all of this. Um, the first is that there still is the symbolism of the washing away of sins. Um, because we're going into the water, the idea of being cleansed is, is, is somewhere near the center of the symbolism involved in baptism. Um, I, I'll read several passages from Acts throughout this episode, um, but one of them, Acts 22, verse 16, when Paul is speaking to people and speaking specifically to Jewish people, um, he says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And so again, the idea, we, we could say, all right, straightforward, if we're thinking about what, what is baptism, it symbolizes the idea of our sins being washed away. It's, it's like we're being cleansed. Um, but there's more to it than that. There's the idea of identification. And identification has to do with who we're being baptized into. 
Um, and that's a lot of times the terminology that the New Testament uses for this, that there's an idea of we are now identifying with Jesus publicly through our baptism. Um, and so Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Paul writes, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so it's the idea that this wasn't just sort of an anonymous ritual washing where in a general way you're saying, I need to be cleansed. It's that you're being cleansed and you're giving Jesus the attention and credit and the identification. I believe in Jesus, so I'm being baptized not into just a generic baptism of repentance, but into the name of Jesus. Um, Acts 2.38, at the end of Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verse 48, when Peter goes and preaches to Cornelius and Gentiles who are there, at the end of it, after they believe and they receive the Holy Spirit, it says, so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 19, 5, uh, when Paul meets up with some, uh, some of those who were believers in John the Baptist and had responded to his call but didn't yet know the full story about Jesus, it says, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so it seems like, all right, two significant things going on with baptism and with the symbolism in it. Um, the first has to do with the idea that Baptism represents the washing away of our sins, that there's water that cleans us, that cleanses us. That's part of the symbolism and why water is involved. But the second part is that there's an identification. We are being baptized in the name of Jesus. We are publicly identifying with him as our Lord and Savior before other people, showing that we believe in him, saying that we are baptized not just into a generic God or a generic repentance or a new phase of life, but specifically in the name of Jesus. So big picture, that's the what. That's what's going on. When we baptize someone, we, we typically use the mantra that we use uh, that was used by Jesus at the end of the Great Commission in the Gospel of Matthew. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's specifically baptism into Christ, into the Trinity, into the idea of Jesus being the Savior and Jesus being the Lord and going public with that. Um, so with that said, then the question comes up, all right, well, how should we baptize? And the reason this comes up is because throughout church history, and even today, there have been different sort of expressions and modes by which people get baptized. Um, sometimes there's sprinkling, where you, you take some water and sprinkle it on the head of the infant, which we'll talk about later, or just the, the head of the person who's being baptized. Sometimes there's pouring, which is a little bit sim similar to, to sprinkling, where maybe there's water that's not sprinkled, but that's poured on the head in order to symbolize this. Um, and then for, for me and for many of us who are evangelicals, the most common way that we've experienced baptism is through what we call immersion, dipping somebody fully into the water so that they're fully immersed and then they're brought out of the water. Now, the, the question about mode of baptism, I, I'm going to say up front, uh, I don't see this as an A-level issue. Um, I, I don't see this as an issue where it's like, hey, um, if somebody's doing it differently than the way I see it in the Bible, then they're a false teacher. I, I don't think that that's true at all. I think that this is one where it's okay for Christians to agree to disagree on this and still be participating in the same Christian community, still call each other brothers and sisters. All of that is fine. Um, with that said, I do think that the best evidence from the Bible is that the best mode for baptism is immersion. Um, and, and I'll give a couple of reasons for this. Um, some of the reason is symbolic and some of the reason is historical. And so one of them, and I'd say this is, this is not uh, ironclad evidence, but maybe it's kind of soft evidence. Um, so the word used in the Bible for baptism is the, the word baptizo which is, is just basically transliterated. It's how we got our English word baptized. You can hear it there, baptizo. Um, there's another Greek word that's em baptizo. Tizo. And so it's, it's basically there, there's a prefix, there's like a preposition attached to the front of it. Um, when em baptismo is used, it's often used for the idea of dipping. Um, in fact, it's, it's used in the, um, in the passage that relates to the Last Supper when Jesus talks about the one betraying him being the one who will dip, um, dip his bread um, next to him. Um, the, that word used is embaptizo. And so some people say, hey, just in a straightforward way, this is talking about dipping something. 
Um, that's possible. Again, it's not the ex same exact word. I'd say right, that that's a little bit of soft evidence, just in pointing to what the word actually means. And beyond that, I think at Jesus' baptism, there's evidence for the idea of him being immersed. Uh, again, I'd say that this isn't 100%, but first of all, John is baptizing people in the Jordan River, and so this isn't sort of separate, that this is actually in a body of water. And then after Jesus is baptized by John, it says in Matthew 3, 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Now, it, the, this could mean sort of like he comes in and John sprinkles him or pours water over his head, and then Jesus like emerges and gets back out of the water, gets up out of the water. Um, but also in a straightforward way, it could be he's getting up out of the water because John has dipped him in and is lifting him up. So I, again, I'd point to this to say, all right, not ironclad, but maybe another thing that says that this may suggest this. Um, but then also, I think there's significance with how baptism is symbolized. Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says this, We were also, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Um, Colossians 2.12 says something very similar. It says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll throw in also, may, maybe as a little bit, not quite as direct, but, but connected. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, it, he relates the idea of the flood back to baptism. It's, it's complicated, but just this last part he says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Um, the reason I throw in the 1 Peter 1 there at the end is because if baptism has to do with the idea of washing, then the full immersive experience seems to symbolize that clearer than sort of a, a partial washing, a, a partial sprinkling or a partial pouring. But beyond that, here's the part that I think is really significant. Um, Paul, both in Romans and in Colossians, he talks about the idea of baptism is symbolizing the idea of being dead and buried with Christ and then being raised from the dead. Um, of the three modes of baptism that I just named, you know, kind of the sprinkling, the pouring, and the immersion, immersion definitely visualizes that in the most evocative way. The idea that somebody goes down into the water and then emerges back up from the water. And, and this is one of the reasons why I love baptisms. It, it, part of it is that it involves people's stories and it's an exciting thing and the community is celebrating but also when we do a baptism at LBF Church, every time, let, let's say we're doing eight baptisms, eight times we get to see played out the idea that we die and are buried with Christ and then we're raised to new life. You go down into the water, you emerge out of the water. And while baptism isn't the moment that somebody is saved, it's, it's a symbol of the fact that somebody's been saved. Um, it, it visualizes that. It shows the idea that we come out a new person. Our sins have been washed away. We've identified with Jesus through his death and through his resurrection. So again, while I don't see this as an A-level issue, um, and, and I wouldn't say, and I wouldn't say, hey, we, we need to make this sort of a, uh, a major crux point with other Christians on this. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't think that there's a right answer on this. I, I do actually think that there's a right answer on this. Now, I think that there are circumstances where somebody has has a disability or has something going on where um, full immersion is just really not practical or not possible. And in, in situations like that, I, I, I wouldn't be a stickler on this. I wouldn't say, no, that's the only way the baptism counts. I'd say, all right, let, let's find another way within the spirit of this. But all things being equal, th this is a beautiful way to visualize this. And that, that to me, at least strongly, strongly suggests that I think that that's what was expected, that that's the mode that was expected, that you're fully immersed and then you're brought back up out of the water, symbolizing the idea that you have died with Christ and you've been raised to new life. Uh, that's a little bit about the how. Um, while I think that the how, like I said, is, is not something to divide over, the who is something that I think is of more significance. Um, not to the point 
where those who do infant baptism, uh, am I going to say I think that they're false teachers or anything like that? I, I really don't believe that. Um, but I do believe that there's a clearer right answer on the whole idea of who. And again, that this typically revolves around the debate, um, should infants be baptized as a way of sort of symbolizing that they belong to the covenant community, to the community of Jesus, or should it just be believers, those who have the ability, even if they're pretty young, you know, even if they're, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, something like that, but who have the ability to express a personal faith in Jesus and people that we really believe have placed their faith in Jesus. They're not just part of a Christian home, but they have personally placed their faith in Jesus. Um, I definitely believe that that it's the latter. I, I definitely believe that uh, it, it's what we typically call believer's baptism. That baptism is those who have made a profession of faith in Jesus. I think if you were to read throughout the book of Acts, this is certainly the pattern that we see in Acts, that people believe and then they're baptized over and over again. They believed and then they were baptized. They believed and then they were baptized. You believe and then you get baptized. I'll, I'll talk more about this in the when and how that plays into it, but this is the constant pattern. And I think that it makes sense because baptism, in many ways, it's it's so tied in with conversion in the New Testament. They're so closely tied in that some of the ways that, that baptism is brought up in the letters, in the epistles, it's almost as if baptism is just synonymous with getting saved, which we can misunderstand and say baptism saves you, e even the way that Peter says it um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, when he talks about the whole idea um, that the, the flood with Noah's Ark relates to um, baptism, that now saves you also. I, I think what he's doing there is saying the people were saved sort of like through the water, and now water is involved in our salvation. Um, I don't think Peter there is saying precisely, as long as you get baptized, you are saved. But I think that he is making the point that this is so tied in with conversion. This is so tied in with when you put your faith in Jesus that it's it, it sort of goes hand in hand. You repent, you believe, and you get baptized, and so it goes along with salvation. So over and over again, I believe this is the pattern. Um, where there would be some pushback for those who advocate for infant baptism, there are a couple of passages that talk about households. So one of them is Acts chapter 16, verse 33. Um, some of you will be familiar. This is a great passage where Paul and Silas are in prison, and then God brings an earthquake, and all the prisoners could have run away, but they don't run away. Um, and this makes the jailer know that he's, he's not going to be executed for losing the prisoners. He comes to Paul and Silas. He asks them what he has to do to be saved. They say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved you and your household. And then in Acts 16, 33, it says, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Um, similarly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, Paul, the, the bigger point of this, if you were to look up this passage, is that Paul is making the point that it was not important to him that he personally baptized people. And he didn't like the idea of people sort of bragging like, I was baptized by Paul, or I was baptized by Peter. He, he's saying I, that that doesn't matter, you were baptized into Christ. But he starts naming off like, yeah, there are a few that I baptized. He, his main point is, I'm glad I didn't baptize more of you because then this would be more of an issue. But amongst those, he says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. And so for, for those who would advocate for infant baptism, they would see this as at least evidence of the idea that there was something that maybe was always going on or began to go on where households were baptized, which could have involved infants or young people who had not yet made a profession of faith, but there was the idea of sort of the, the, the jailer maybe as the head of his household or Stephanus as the head of his household saying, my whole household is going to be baptized because we are a Christian family. And, and I got to say, there, there's something about this that I think, I, I think it's easy for us as Americans to be sort of very individualistic about it. And, and again, I still think believer's baptism is the scriptural teaching. Um, but, but I think that we can be blind to the idea that really, when we're reading the pages of the Bible, there's much more of a communal feel to our lives. And so the idea that that a person's conversion would affect the whole family and that that person would say, all right, this is now a Christian household, even if not every member of the Christian household has yet placed their faith in Jesus in a personal way. 
Um, I, I think that for the vast majority of the people who I've talked to who uh, believe in infant baptism and advocate for in infant baptism, um, almost nobody I've ever talked to says that they think that because the child was baptized, that guarantees their salvation. Um, th there are those who would say that mo most people are not claiming that. At least most evangelicals are not claiming that. Like, hey, my child got baptized as an infant. That means that they're going to heaven for sure. Um, it is more of the idea that they are being marked as belonging to the community of Jesus, to a Christian household, to a Christian community. Um, it, in many ways, it, those of you who are involved in our church know that we do something called child dedications, um, which is where parents have a young child and they want to dedicate that child and also dedicate themselves to raising that child with Jesus at the center of their life and with how they're raising them. And so we, we don't baptize children, but we do sort of do a recognition of people who want to say, my, my child is part of this community, we're caring for each other in this community, and we're committing to raising this child in the faith. Um, I think it's not utterly different than what a lot of people are doing with infant baptism. That said, I don't think that the Bible teaches infant baptism. I think with the idea of the whole household believing and the whole household getting baptized, I think that that's not super strong evidence that that's what was going on, that, that all right, well, that just means that infants were being baptized sort of as soon as they were born to enter into the covenant community. I think much more likely the jailer or Stephanus come to believe, their household comes to believe, and, and maybe sort of in in deference to the, the head of the household, um, and maybe not in deference, maybe because they too have come to believe because the, the jailer goes back and tells his family what happens and they all believe also. Stephanus, we, we don't know much about the story, but it's not crazy to think about the idea that his whole household believed and were baptized together. Um, so I don't find it really compelling evidence for infant baptism. Again, not an A-level issue. For me, a, a little bit of more significance than the mode. And part of it, once again, is because I think the mistake surrounding infant baptism is to see it as something that's a little bit like circumcision, like this is sort of the right that you belong to the community, where I don't think that's what the New Testament teaches about baptism. I think, once again, it symbolizes, it goes along with conversion, and it symbolizes the idea that I have died to my old life with Christ, and I am being raised to new life with Christ. That's what happens not when you're born into a Christian household, but that's what happens when you're converted, when you repent and believe. So once again, not an A-level issue, but something that I do think is significant and why we as a church, we practice believer's baptism, which sometimes does involve kids who are you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 on the younger side, but they have the ability to articulate their belief in Jesus in a personal way. Um, so finally, last question to deal with on this is the question of when should we baptize? And here's why I ask this question. Um, because sometimes that there's a little bit of a question of like, hey, we, we seem to see in the book of Acts, they're like, people are just getting baptized right away. Like they repent and right then and there, they get in the water and they're baptized. Should we be doing that or should we sort of be vetting people. And all right, what, what happens again, if I'm like, I've been a Christian for 30 years and I've never got baptized, is there still significance to this? Um, so what I'd say on the when question is that if we read the New Testament, there's no doubt that, especially in the book of Acts, it often is right at the moment of conversion. Like you get baptized. It's not like, all right, you go through a class and three weeks later, um, after your conversion, you get baptized. It's like right then you repent and you believe. Now, Part of what I think is worth taking into account is that in a lot of those cases, um, I think people were a lot clearer or at least had a great sense of clarity on what they were doing. And these were Jewish people who knew the scriptures, knew they were believing in Jesus, and knew the stakes of believing in Jesus, knew that this was likely going to ostracize them from the community, that they sort of had counted the cost and they had come to believe in Jesus. Um, or, and many times, these were outsiders who had a sense that they were now making a major, that, that they weren't just sort of adding Jesus to their life, they were making a major life decision here. And so they were coming to believe and be baptized, and those were seen as synonymous. And so um, whether it was kind of spontaneous right in the moment, or maybe it was somebody who had been hearing and considering the gospel as Paul or Peter or Philip or whoever were teaching it, and then eventually they come to believe and right then they get baptized, it does frequently go along with conversion. Um, I do think right now, I, I know of churches that, that do baptisms 
right away like that. If they're doing a baptism, they say, if you want to get baptized today, come on back. Um, I certainly am in, in no position to say that that's unbiblical. That, that's just not true. It, it It's more in line with the pattern that we see in the Bible um, than sort of like waiting a little while before. Um, what I'd say is I think that the danger of the spontaneous baptisms is that people don't necessarily know what they're doing. Like we live in a culture where in, in most of our settings, um, there's not a great immediate cost to professing faith in Jesus. Um, in, in certain professions and in certain circles, there are, but in a lot of settings, somebody could see it more as just sort of the, the therapeutic gospel, sort of the, the, maybe even the the health and wealth message, sort of the idea of like, hey, my life is not very good. Jesus will help me with my life. Sure, I'll get baptized as a symbol of that. So I think because of that, there's wisdom in really trying to make sure people understand what they're doing. Um, I, I'd say for, for me, sort of the ideal scenario, if there was, if, if there was somebody in our church um, who had confessed faith in Jesus for the first time, um, I would not personally be an advocate of like, right now, let's baptize them. I would, but I also wouldn't be an advocate of like, well, let's wait two years. Uh, I would be more like, let, let's have a couple weeks to be able to talk to really make sure that they understand what's going on here and what baptism is. Because for the Jews, they had the ritual washing. And I think for a lot of the surrounding areas, they, they had a parallel to this. This is something that's kind of weird that Christians do, at least in our culture. There, there's not this clear parallel to this. And so making sure that there's understanding is significant. And part of this is just even experiential uh, for me that um, since since being on staff here, uh, I, I've experienced baptisms where we baptized somebody and it seemed great. Um, and it was somebody that like, we really didn't know before and we never saw them afterwards. Um, we don't know if they're involved in some other church they're not involved in our church. And to me, it was like, gosh, we, we don't just want to sort of be a, a baptizing service operation here. We're like, hey, if you want to get baptized, stop in, we'll baptize you, and then you'll be on your way. We, we want to see this as being baptized into Christ and into his community. It doesn't mean it has to be our church, that there's lots of great Christian communities, but you shouldn't be sort of like baptized and then off on your own, not in Christian community. So I think on a practical level, there is some wisdom at looking at this. Um, I think we even have a story in the Bible of somebody who got baptized, and then it was it was clear, maybe at least on his part, it was rash. This comes up in Acts chapter 8, where there's a magician named Simon, and uh, he hears the message of Jesus, and he sees the miracles that the apostles are doing, uh, or, or at least that Philip is doing at first. He comes to believe, he's baptized. Later on, the apostles show up, and they lay hands on the believers, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And Simon, being a magician, he's like, well, I want to be able to do that too. And so he goes and he offers the apostles money to be able to almost like buy their trick. Like, it, all right, if, if I give you money, show me how you do this thing where so I can also lay hands on people and give them the Holy Spirit. Um, Peter's response to him is, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now, looking at Peter's words there, it's possible that Simon was a genuine believer, but a very immature believer. I would just say, Peter's words are really strong here. You are full of bitterness and sin. It's possible that he's just a very immature believer. By Peter's words, I, I would say better explanation is he doesn't think he's really a believer. He doesn't think he's really come to believe. And he, he maybe came to believe in some surface way that just had to do with the miracles that we're seeing. And he showed his true colors by saying, I want to buy this power that you have. Um, I bring this up just because, all right, here's an example of even back in the New Testament where somebody believes, gets baptized, and then not very long later, at, at least reviews, it reveals at the very least that he had a very faulty understanding of the gospel and of baptism, and maybe reveals that he wasn't a believer at all and that he sort of had been in it for the wrong reasons. Um, I'm not saying this to critique Philip for doing this. I'm saying that is a real thing that happens. And I think in our culture, um, there is some wisdom 
in really trying to help people make sure they understand the gospel and, and those of us who are leaders doing our due diligence on this. Um, with that said, uh, I'll address, if you've been a Christian for a long time and you're like, well, I never got baptized, it's supposed to kind of be something for new Christians, um, but it's something that I've never done, do I need to do it? Um, well, I don't see baptism as something that it's like, well, it's 100% required and you're in clear sin if you don't do it. Um, it's the clear expectation in the New Testament. Like the idea of somebody becoming a Christian and not getting baptized just would be a weird concept. So my counsel would be to say, yeah, go ahead and get baptized um, for two reasons. First of all, even if this is years later, you still get to be a part of the public demonstration of what it's like to die, the, to die to the old self and to be raised to new life. And you get to do that publicly in front of people. And secondly, because you get to proclaim in front of other people with your actions and sometimes with your testimony that Jesus is your Lord. And so while many may know it, maybe there are people in your workplace or your extended family that show up to your baptism and get to see that demonstration. That's a great thing to do. Um, some of you were baptized as infants, and now you're like, all right, now I have put my faith in Jesus. What do I do about this? Um, my, my ideal scenario is I would say like, yeah, get baptized. Like, get baptized and have it be your choice just because I believe in believer's baptism. I, I, I wouldn't even see it as like, you're getting baptized again. I would say like, you're getting baptized New Testament style. Um, there are some that don't, and again, I, I wouldn't make this sort of like something that I'd, I'd go to the mattresses on, but, but I would look at it and say, yeah, all things being equal, because baptism accompanies conversion, if you've now come to believe, come and get baptized publicly where you can proclaim your faith in Jesus instead of it being something that you didn't have a choice in. And when you do, again, you get to be a part of this great symbol. Um, I don't want to pretend that these are the only questions in the New Testament about baptism. Some of you may want on this video to leave comments or questions. Maybe there's a, a question or a part of baptism that um, you want to push back on or want to ask a question about or want to ask for a follow-up on. I'd be happy to engage with you on that. But I hope this is helpful in just understanding what baptism is, how we do it, who we baptize, and the timing of baptism, because all those are significant things as we look at this beautiful symbol that God has given us in order to show that he has made us new through Jesus. Um, well, if you have, as I already mentioned, if you have questions or comments about this, or if you're interested in getting baptized, there's different things that you can go through. But if you leave a comment or question on this video, um, either uh, you can get all the videos of the Christian Contrast um, on YouTube through our YouTube page, Life Bible Fellowship Church, or you can also find them on our web page, lbf.church. Um, if you leave a comment, especially related to a question or an inquiry about getting baptized, I'd be happy to interact with you on that. I, I love going back and looking at the comments that people leave and being able to interact about what God is doing in our lives through this. Um, we do episodes of The Christian Contrast every two weeks. So in two weeks, we'll be back with a new episode talking about how walking with Jesus leads us to live differently than those in the world around us. So thank you for taking the time to watch and to listen to this, and we'll see you in two weeks with a new episode.